talk, and it's again on, on Zeckendorf's decompositions. I'd like to introduce uh, Zeus Dante Simora, who will be speaking again, as well as Julian Lu and Jack Miller. We'll be speaking on a short range of random differences in a number of zones of Zeckendorf's decompositions. Yeah, to, okay. So I'm Julian Liu, and I'm working with my uh, colleague Zeus and Jack today to present you to this topic. And to translate that into English, that means what happens to exact your decompositions when we add them. Okay, so Fibonacci, Fibonacci numbers, start with one and two, define by recurrence relation, get the next one from adding the previous two. Easy. Zackendorf's theorem says that every non-negative integer can be uniquely written as a sum of non-adjacent Fibonacci number. The proof works really easy. It's just every time you choose the largest Fibonacci number possible, and then you run this greedy algorithm until you reach the end, and we claim that this is the proof of Zackendorf's theorem. Okay, so let's compare the Zackendorf decomposition to the binary decomposition. We say every non-negative number can be uniquely written as a sum of a powers of two, and these are the examples. So like, uh, you can write any non-negative integer as a string of zeros and ones. That's how it works. And for the Zackendorf case, it's the same string of zeros and ones, except that we don't allow consecutive ones because by the recurrence law of Fibonacci, if you have two consecutive ones, you get a one. The left in the next position. So binary decomposition of bit 14, you write it as 2 cubed plus 2 squared plus 2, and you have three ones in the decomposition. It's a string of zeros and ones, well defined. And for the second of decomposition, you write it as f6 plus f1, which means the sixth Fibonacci number and the first Fibonacci number. You have two ones in the decomposition and zero elsewhere. So we write the Zackendorf decomposition of 14 has this string, and we define the number of summons in the Zackendorf decomposition to be 0x. So in this case, 0, 14 would be equal to 2, because you have two ones in the decomposition. And we also define z sub i of x to be the indicator whether we have uh, a summon in the i position of the Fibonacci sequence. So if fi is in your second of decomposition, the quantity should be 1 and 0 elsewhere. OK, so we can do the arithmetic and hope we get some neat result. So let's add 14 with 5. And you can see we first do the second of decomposition into the strings of zeros and ones. We add them together trivially. It works fine. We check, OK, zeros and ones in the string, no consecutive ones. So that works, and that's exactly the second of decomposition of 19. And we hope that, that this could work like for any possible addition, but this is something really optimistic to expect. And this is the counter example. You can't just always add the two strings trivially, because sometimes if you add it trivially, you get two consecutive, consecutive ones, and you have to do something because that's not that's not a legal second of decomposition. So here, what you're doing is that you add these two ones, you clear them out, you get a new digit there. And here's another bad example. Like, so here you add these two exactly of decomposition trivially, you get a two in the decomposition, which is something we don't allow, because in the definition, we only allow zeros and ones in the decomposition. So here, you need to do something with this two, you want to split it into two Fibonacci numbers to make the legal exact of decomposition. So how should we do that systematically? Uh, we need rules to simplify the expressions. So thanks to the previous small people, we have the exact of gain defined to be exactly these moves that we want to apply while our trivial addition of streams doesn't quite work as the exact of decomposition. So the first one is, if you have two consecutive ones, you add them together to get the next one. And the second rule is if you have two ones in the same position, you, dis you do this splitting move, you break these two fi's into fi plus one plus fi minus two. Something to notice is that, is that in the initial uh, 
in the initial part of Fibonacci sequence, things work a little bit differently because if you have these two F2 decomposed as F1 plus F3, but by, the def, but by, but by this uh, rule, uh, this general rule, it should be F0 plus F3. This is because if we, were, if we were trying to define F0, it should be the same as F1. So yeah, a little bit of generalization and case, cases. And also, if you have two F1s, you get, you just get the next Fibonacci number. Yeah, something happens in the initial case, uh, worth noting. Okay. So this is a theorem on the second of game. So given any sum of Fibonacci numbers as an initial state, what does this mean? You are considering this trivial sum of two strings, and then you apply these moves, and people prove that this second of game terminates, which means no matter how you apply these moves, you, you will eventually reach an end of the game where you can apply no moves anymore. Okay, so another thing is that the game ends in precisely in the second of decomposition. So in the finite time, you play the game until you cannot play the game anymore and you get the second of decomposition. Yeah, I'll leave the rest to Zeus and Jack. All right, so we call that Z of X is the number of summons in the second of decomposition. And a nice thing uh, about this game is that uh, you can observe that if we compare the second of decomposition of X and, and C of x and c of y separately, uh, we have an equality of comparing it to c of x plus y. Why is that the case? Uh, you can use the right the second order of the x, right the second order of the second order of the second y, uh, you sum them like trivially, and you're gonna have c of x plus c of y terms. And whenever you play the second order of game, uh, all moves either make the number of tokens the same, or uh, make the number of sums the same, or decrease the number of sums. So at the end, you're gonna have at most uh, z of x plus z of y, but you have exactly z of x plus y. The question that we're looking for is what other properties uh, under addition the number of seconds number of summons have? One way to think about the question is by fixing the number t and picking a random x represented by a string of size n, just like we pick a number of size n. Uh, and just like in, if I see you to think about a four digit number, you, you don't want that first digit to be zero, because that's going to be a last digit number. We're going to require the first number to be uh, one, and that's going to imply that the number right before it is going to be zero, because we don't want consecutive ones. Uh, and the other ones we can choose kind of arbitrarily. This turns out to be equivalent of two of the same x between fn and fn plus one. I want you to notice that there are fn minus one of such numbers, so here we're choosing uh, n minus two uh, things in with, with a question mark to choose between zero and one. And the answer to the question is that minus one is going to come. It's going to be equal later. Uh, okay, so if you have this fixed t and, and, and we pick this random x, how do we compare the number of summons in x and the number of summons in x plus t? Or in other words, how do we compare? The, how, how, what is the distribution of this delta t of z? Where's the difference of those? All right, we have, uh, for t equals one, we have proved, we have described this distribution exactly. Uh, so we pick an x n to be a variable uh, uniformly chosen between f n and f n plus one. Uh, and what happens is that the probability that this, this number is one is gonna be phi to the minus two, uh, phi to the minus two again, and then after that, it's gonna be a geometric series of ratio of phi to the two. So at any time, you get phi to the minus four, phi to the minus six, and so on. I'm gonna go here to proof for t equals one and l equals one. So we wanted to know when does the delta z equals one. That's gonna be given only if uh, c of x plus one is c of x plus one. Uh, and that's gonna happen if and only if the first two digits uh, here is zero. That's because when you add the one, you're gonna change the zero to one and there's, no gonna, there's not gonna be more simplification made because no, no two things are allowed. Uh, and since we want the equality here, for that inequality, we don't want any simplifications. And remember the asterisk. Here we have uh, f n. Uh, sorry, we have here n minus four question marks to choose from. And so the answer to how many ways we can choose that is f n minus three out of the f n minus numbers at the beginning. Uh, so the probability is f n minus three over f n minus one. 
I'm just a simple five things of making things bigger. Well, time goes to infinity, so we have a fixed number, and this number is going to be teacher minus two. Very similar structure is going to work for t equals one and any other value of t. Sorry, t equals one and any other value of l. For any other values of t, uh, we cannot precisely describe the distribution the same way that we did, but we have proof that if we go far enough, uh, just a little bit far enough, so uh, t is between fk and fk plus one, we just need to go k over two far enough to make sure that uh, the ratio of consecutive things is still uh, phi to minus two. So we don't know what happens in, in the middle of the distribution, but in the tail of the distribution is still uh, portrays this geometric uh, behavior. All right, so for fixed t in the of x, we can pretty easily compare uh, c, of, c of x plus c and c of x. Another way to think about the question is if we start pick a random x and a random y, how we compare x plus y, uh, c of x plus y versus c of x and c of y. And Jack's going to answer the question for you. Yes, so let's first recall that zx plus y is at most zx plus cy. If you recall that this was like a proof by story, the right hand side is sort of the number of ones you have when you add two strings on top of each other. Then you play the Zeckendorf game, and the number of ones can only decrease, and then you left, you're left with the right hand side, the left hand side representing the number of ones, so this inequality must be true because of playing the Zeckendorf game. And this um, sort of motivates us at least to consider the following statistic p of x and y, which represents the number of ones you lose by adding two strings on top of each other and playing the Zeckendorf game. It's a non negative statistic, and it sort of encapsulates how many ones are lost by playing the game. Um, so then our conjecture is um, by big data, um, <laughs> that the statistic p should be asymptotically normal as n goes to infinity. Um, why? Well, there's a previous small group that showed that just for the number of ones in a Zeckendorf decomposition of a random integer xn, that it's asymptotically normal if you standardize it to a mean zero and variance one. Their proof was to do things very explicitly. It was to say, if you have basically an, an n-digit random integer, probability that it has k ones uh, for digits is n minus k juice k minus one, arising from starting the bars problem, and then you just divide by the total number of things. Then you use some Sterling formula, some classical 1800s statistics stuff, like the Wampel box, and you basically get uh, Gaussianity. But to generalize from z to t, when we're adding two strings on top of each other, and there's sort of complexity when moving things around by playing the Zeckendorf game, there's some dependence between the things, um, we need to think a bit more stochastically. So, um, to see as an example of how to think stochastically, let's recall this theorem from Le Kirkaker in 1951. Le Kirkaker actually discovered Zeckendorf's theorem about Zeckendorf. Um, and while he discovered it, he noticed that the expected number of ones, if you have a, um, an n digit random integer, is n over phi squared plus one, meaning a positive proportion of number of ones, with a big O one error term. So, we can prove this uh, by thinking randomly as if you recall those indicator random variables zi is the indicator that the ith digit is one. Well, the probability that the ith digit is one is by similar counting arguments like Zeus showed, you put a one in the ith position and you just count the number of options to the left, count the number of options to the right, and you multiply them together. That's how many total integers would satisfy the ith digit being one, then you divide by the total number of things. And then we use our favorite thing in the world, which is like Binet's formula for Fibonacci numbers, an explicit um, thing telling us the growth rate of Fibonacci numbers and, and the error term. Um, and it gives us one over phi squared plus one plus a geometric error term. And then recall that z of x, which is the number of ones, is the sum of these indicator random variables, z1 through zn, by linearity of expectation. This is like a very common uh, probability argument. Um, you'll get this result. So um, now our, our stochastic proof of what was done in 2010, where we're not going to use uh, explicit binomial coefficients, is to think of the, um, each indicator random variable as a brutally random variable, kind of like a coin flip, and basically the probability that, you're, um, that the jth digit is one is roughly one over phi squared plus one, and some small error. And then the covariance among each one of these, if, if you consider the rth digit and the sth digit, and the digits are really far apart, you expect that playing the Zeckendorf game, you won't really, this digit, the conditioning on whether it's a zero or one, won't really affect the other digit. Um, and this is encapsulated by the fact that the covariance is extremely small. 
And then you can apply the central limit theorem for strongly mixing random variables, basically saying, yeah, covariance is pretty small for most things. Um, we expect them to still have a central limit theorem, even though they're not independent. So before, and what was just outlined is the case of Z, and we now can consider the case of T, which is more complicated, and um, this is sort of our stochastic um, method for T. So you decompose T as T1 through Tn plus one, um, by or Tj denotes the sum of these three indicator random variables. And you see it's, um, these two are independent, and then this one depends on the other ones, and that's where this dependence comes in that we need to take care of. Um, so the outline of showing that T is asymptotically normal when you standardize it to have mean zero and variance one is that, yes, each one of these Tj, just like before, looking like each one of them looks like virtually one over P squared plus one. In this case, it converges to something a little bit more complicated because it's support, it, it support is minus two, uh, minus one, zero, one, and two. It's a little bit more options, but um, it essentially converges, meaning if you pick a really large string and then you pick some digits that are not too close to the boundaries of the number that um, the um, distribution of what's going on looks roughly the same. And then you need some sort of covariance-like result, but it's a little bit more technical than that, but they're, they're nearly uncorrelated for um, indices that are far apart, just like in the uh, earlier case. And then by central limit theorem, we'll start mixing, um, we're able to finish. But an important thing is this um, gap lemma, which is essentially to control what I said about digits being really far apart. You don't want playing the second door game in one region to all of a sudden move a sequence of ones that will affect digits in the other region. And this basically comes from this gap lemma, which says that if you pick two large random um, integers, that the probability that their second door decompositions will share a run of five zeros in a certain slot, so say um, the j index all the way to the j plus fourth index, say there, there's a j such that for both numbers, there's just a bunch of zeros for both numbers in such an index. Well, that means, for example, that X and Y will have zeros here, and then you'll have some ones over here, some ones over here, but by playing the Zeckendorf game, there's no move that could shoot a one. You know, the most you can move a one is here, FK plus two, and here, FK plus four. So this zero here and FK plus three is sort of a wall that prevents ones from crossing over. And we've shown basically with extremely high probability for large N that almost all um, integer pairs will satisfy this, and that basically means that you can do the analysis um, chopping off piece by piece, and then as you let n go to infinity, things stabilize quickly. Um, and this result for how many summons are lost, that's what the statistic t represents, we believe this will also apply more generally to playing games with adding strings on top of each other for general um, positive linear recurrence sequences, such as um, Tribonacci numbers, uh, binary expansions, base 10 as well, like base b expansions are much easier to work with because there's no dependence, because you can have adjacent ones. Um, and more generally, just sequences that look like this, where the, um, all of these are non-negative integers and the coefficient front of a minus one has to be positive. And then you need some canonical initial conditions, which then allow you to decompose any integer into, the, um, into a unique legal decomposition using these recurrence things, just like Zeckendorf or binary expansion, something unique. Yeah, thank you so much. Direction. Well, just you said the gap of five because you could sort of potentially get to k plus four and k plus two. And I'm asking whether you could get that k plus four or only get k plus five. So the, the, the way that we prove the gap lemma, uh, we have proof for all numbers between five and one. I mean, I mean five kind of implies four, but with a better uh, constant. But I think we just be sure we're going to use five because. If there are one, like this can shoot two back, yeah. and this actually can shoot 
too forward because uh -huh. things can come from very far before and go forward. Uh -huh. And so the wall over here, uh, yeah. We don't want any complication. We want to make sure that they are completely separate. So we're using five that, yeah. This zero here in the middle stays zero always and, and never crosses. Uh, maybe we use four, but we have room for both. One very interesting thing that we were trying to prove when we couldn't is to prove the scat for the zero for any length. Uh, the way that this proof works, we kind of grind through uh, some linear algebra and find the explicit value using some matrix, etc. Yeah, we, we could expand, um, we could either expand our analysis of matrices, but the earlier example with L equals 5 here, and we want this gap, we're doing first step analysis and doing case work. It gives us a matrix that is 69 by 69. And um, just for larger L, and you still want exponential error because we're using a statistics theorem that we need strong, strong alpha mixing of the dependent events um, that are far apart in time as a stochastic process. But, um, we have considered doing something a little bit different, like um, using not not using matrices. We can just use a, 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 a sort of accounting argument to get a, this gap of five, but instead of exponential decay and probability, we can replace that with an n to the minus one over twenty, which just does not decay. <laughs> it just does not decay sufficiently fast. If it was super polynomial, that would be fine. But this is n to the minus one over twenty. A little too slow to use some um, statistics theorem on mixing. Do you plug in this for products, so the sums? Mm. So, so the nice thing about this is that there's uh, there are generalizations of the second order game for this and the second order theorem. Uh, so we would need a generalization for the second order theorem to, to to do more complicated recurrences, uh, possible, but not a, not in the literature. Yeah, I, I mean, in terms of um, multiplying, it would be interesting to see if, at least in, in terms of data, if there's some certain biases, you know, if in, the numbers factor a lot, does that say something about if there's, if there's some, the, the result in the number of ones, does that help somehow slightly bias? So something interesting we'll consider. Thanks. Thank you guys again.